Dear ENT surgeons and listeners from all over the world, warm welcome and greetings to all of you. I'm Esther Broda, product manager for ENT catheters at Spiegel and Tice. Excitement fills the air as we kick off today's webinar with Professor Di Martino, head surgeon at Diakonie Krankenhaus Bremen, Germany. Our focus today Eustachian tube dysfunction, diagnostics, and treatment. Allow me to introduce shortly Professor Di Martino. He is a distinguished figure in the German ENT community. Following his medical degree, Professor Di Martino embarked on a diverse career, serving as an assistant doctor in anesthesia and undergoing specialist training in otorhinolaryngology at the University Hospital Greifswald. He achieved notable awards, including the Bräucher Preis and Degum Head and Neck Section Science Prize. And in 2005, he assumed the position of head surgeon at Diakonie Krankenhaus in Bremen. We are honored to have Professor Di Martino with us, and we are eagerly anticipate the insight he will share with us in today's webinar on Eustachian tube dysfunction. We will touch upon various facets under his expert guidance, such as exploring the Eustachian tube dysfunction and its epidemiology, navigating the complex anatomy, emphasizing a holistic role of the Eustachian tube beyond its opening, highlighting the critical importance of middle ear erasion, understanding diagnostics, differential diagnosis and therapeutic option of ETD, presenting the balloon eustachian tuboplasty procedure with tuba vent balloon catheter, and talking about outcomes and complications proven by numerous studies of BET. And finally, he will share his personal experience. After the presentation, there will be enough time to answer all your questions and you will be provided answers by Professor Di Martino. You are already invited to post your questions during the session using the chat function. So now it's time to hand over to Professor Di Martino. Thank you. Hello, dear colleagues. My name is Ercole Di Martino, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this Spiegel and Tice webinar about modern eustachian tube dysfunction diagnostics and therapy. After my presentation, we will have enough time for discussion. So feel free to ask questions and I'll be happy if you join us for a vivid scientific exchange. There we are. Here is my disclosure. And uh, now I want to introduce you to Sue, a fascinating lady I met about 12 years ago in Chicago at the Natural History Museum. And what thrilled me were not her impressive teeth, but when you look um, on the left, lower left, you see her stapes. And when you compare it to a human stapes on the opposite side, um, First of all, you see this tremendous dimension, but what is more important is the evolutionary aspect. It shows us that this system for middle ear aeration and also for hearing is very old, very well approved and a very efficient one. But still we have problems and these are um, the eustachian tube uh, function problems we are talking about and how are they defined. Well, typically we have an oral fullness, uh, maybe pain, maybe discomfort, maybe popping. And when we look in the ear with our microscope, we see probably uh, tympanic retraction or we see fluid in the middle ear. And if this lasts less than three months, we talk about an acute uh, problem. But if it lasts longer, and this is in many cases, um, uh, we have a chronic eustachian tube dysfunction. 
we have to distinguish from this the Barrow challenge. The Barrow challenge is more a clinical diagnosis um, because these are the patients who have problems, for example, while diving or while flying. To make the diagnosis, we can um, use a pressure chamber, but this is restricted to academic um, settings um, because not everyone has a pressure chamber. So um, it is mainly a clinical diagnosis. And the other very important um, diagnosis we have to distinguish is the open tube, the patulous tube. So characteristic here is autophony and the um, movement of the eardrum just going with the, breath, with the breath. How big is the problem? Well, we, we talk about about 6% patients worldwide, more or less, and um, up to 60% of our patients report problems while flying or diving. Uh, for the US, we have data that there are 4 million children and 12 million adults affected. To make things more complicated, there is a recent study by Guy and co-workers from Halle University who did research on patients for autosurgery, but they found that up to 80% patients with the middle ear pathology lack a detectable eustachian tube dysfunction. So, what does this mean? And how can this happen? Um, well, we know that the, the duration of the eustachian tube opening is about 0.2 to 0.4 seconds. The frequency in adults is reported to be 1 to 1.4 openings every minute and in children um, it's about one every five minutes. As we know, um, as a matter of fact, the ET opening is not the whole story. So what we need to understand this fully is we need a more differentiated approach. The, um, the function of the eustachian tube is the regulation of the middle ear hemostasis. And what happens is pressure equilibration. We see a regulation of the gas exchange. We have protection against bacteria, but also against reflux and against sound. And we have a drainage of the middle ear secretion. We have to look at the eustachian tube as central part of a functional entity. And that comprises the nose, the nasopharynx, the eustachian tube itself at its very center, and the middle ear and the mastoid. Well, to complicate things further, um, the anatomy is not very easy to understand. And besides that, we have other factors of relevance. Um, this is mucosa. We have the quite complicated mechanics of the eustachian tube opening. We have the surfactant factors. We have immunologic and neural control. And we have the gas exchange of various uh, gases like nitrogen, CO2, or also oxygen. As a matter of fact, as you can see in this endoscopic picture, but also here in this histologic sample, the eustachian tube is not a tube, but it is a middle ear cleft. And here I want to invite you to a dive into the eustachian tube, um, which um, is a video that was made from my right ear about 15 years ago, and we are now in the cartilaginous part. We proceed slowly, and on top you see the black hole, which is the entrance to the bony part of the eustachian tube. I have to admit that it was not a pleasure to have this done. We did it under local anesthesia, and it was not very pleasant. Um, well, you see, 
we need some time and have, we have to be very diligent and cautious um, and very soon we will enter the bony part of the tube yes here we are and now we go forward and what you see very soon is the entrance to the middle ear cavity and we will pass this and then you will have a very interesting picture because this is the view from the back side of the eardrum and the light you see is an endoscope we put in the ear canal just to demonstrate where we are. When we now proceed further you will see stapes and incus and here we are and I think this is a very very interesting insight a very interesting perspective for the middle ear or in the middle ear. Well, we said, and I think this is scientifically proven, that it is more than just the eustachian tube opening we have to look at. We have four main components, and this is the eustachian tube as a functional valve. And the function is the optimization of the sound transmission um, by leveling pressure variations in the middle ear and to make short openings active and passively. The second function or the second component is the mucosa of the middle ear and the mastoid. Both are um, important for gas transfer and gas exchange. We have the eardrum that acts as a flexible buffer and we have the mastoid that also acts as a rigid gas buffer. And to complete this, there is the autonomous neural function control by baro and chemoreceptors we found in the eardrum and also in the middle ear mucosa. Well, um, what is true that gas exchange in the middle ear shows a net gas absorption and that means we have a tendency to, towards under pressure. And to demonstrate this, we see at the figure at the lower left. This is an experiment Professor Pau did about 20 years ago. He had a constant monitoring of the middle ear pressure uh, by tympanometry. And what he did is he didn't swallow for two hours, two long hours. Really brave uh, what he did. And you see how the pressure in the middle ear is constantly sinking. So this is what also happens in real life when we have, uh, when we have oration problems with the middle ear. And this is in part driven by the pressure gradient of the gases between the middle ear and the venous capillary blood. In, in case of inflammation, the gas exchange increases and of course the under pressure rises. Well, middle ear aeration is important for the acoustic properties of the um, ossicular chain and the composition of the middle ear gases, I, how I, I could show, is different from the normal atmosphere. So this tendency towards under pressure is always persistent. But middle ear pressure needs to be on the same level at the outer atmosphere otherwise we have an impairment of the ossicular movement. So how does this work and how can we check? Well we look at these findings here that are very common to the autosurgeons. Um, when we look at the left side we see a um, completely retracted eardrum in the lower half and in the hypertympanum the eardrum sticks to the promontory, but the upper part is quite normal. On the right side, we see a cholesteatoma with destruction of the bone, but the eardrum itself is completely normal. And in the middle, we see what we encounter as surgeons very often. This is after reconstruction, and you see there is a quite a trophic eardrum, you have, we have a small perforation that occurred 
um, by the time we see the, the prosthesis and this seems to extrude or be close to extrusion. So this is the problems we have to deal with. Well, how comes? We have to look into the anatomy and then we can find um, the reasons or some of the reasons. First of all, we have a lower inferior anterior compartment that is mainly re represented by the middle ear cavity. And it is connected via the anterior isthmus between tensor tympani tendon and the, and the stapes from the upper posterior compartment, which is mainly com comprised epitympanon and from anastoid cells. And the isthmus here is the posterior isthmus, which are the posterior malleus ligaments and the bony wall and the surroundings. So these are the narrow passages and when they are blocked, then of course we have a problem with the aeration and that also um, is a main explanation why we have so different pathologies um, of the eardrum. Well, how can we diagnose? And this is not very easy. There are more than 60 methods and I think every year there is another one, a new one, and um, please um, maybe I have not found every method, so excuse me. Well, of importance is endoscopy, just the visual, um, the visual um, finding we have and also the, um, the movement of the eardrum. We have tympanometry, tympanomanometry and the very nice nine-step inflation-deflation test, um, very well described by Charles Brulestone in his book. We have broadband tympanometry. Um, I worked a long time with sonotomometry, uh, pressure chamber I, I mentioned, and etc. 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 All these diagnostic tools only give us small snap snapshots. And the sad truth is there is not the only one and only tool. There is no universal tool for diagnosis. Well, so we have to find a consensus and this was internationally done in 2015. Um, and Tyson reports that currently no accepted tests for eustachian tube diagnosis exist. And we should rely on a combination of symptoms and signs, but also the majority of tests has a, have a weak evidence. And of course, we have the same in Germany. And I was participant of the German Consensus Conference in 2017. And we consented to rely on uh, tubomanometry and the ETD Q7, a very good questionnaire. Um, that was done by McCall and was published by McCall in 2012. And we have a German variation of this by Holger Zutthoff. And uh, the, we use these um, means to make a, to establish a proper diagnosis. So what to do? Well, practically we use otoscopy and endoscopy to see if we have an eardrum movement and of course to see the structure of the eardrum. Um, we try or we ask the, the patient to perform a Valsalva maneuver. Is he, uh, can he do it in a, in a controlled way? Is it possible? Yes or not? Tympanometry is part of our workup. We give the patients a questionnaire, the ETDQ7. We do audiometry and we always ask about burrow challenge, that means do they have problems with flying or diving. What we found is that um, the effect of a grommet is a very, very good indicator for uh, the obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction. And it is trivial to say our success depends on a proper patient selection. Well, we have to look at the differential diagnosis. Um, here we have um, the endolymphatic hydrops. We have the um, superior circular canal dehiscence. And we have most important, 
the patchwork tube. Um, a number of other instances um, cause problems in the or with the eustachian tube, but are then, they are not situated in the tube, such as adenoids, which is very often in children, nasal polyps, allergic rhinitis, rhinosinusitis, and not so rare laryngopharyngeal reflux. Um, the diagnosis of a patchulous tube um, is mainly based on the clinical, is a clinical diagnosis and is based on history, patient history, of course, the eardrum movement um, synchronous to breathing is, um, is a signature. When you look at the eardrum, you can have very uh, diverse findings like bulging, but also atrophic and sometimes even normal eardrum. And also tympanometry is very diverse. We have a number of therapy action, uh, options, sorry, but also actions. Uh, first of all, the conservative th therapies we advise our patients first to use nasal decongestives or steroids. Um, especially in the children, we use balloons. Um, and in the adults, we, uh, we, um, we advise to do the Valsalva maneuver about 50 times a day. And another um, maneuver is the Appendorf maneuver, where you open your mouth and try to swallow. Well, um, then we have interventional symptomatic therapies, which is mainly the paracentesis and the grommet. And I, I said it is very important to find um, the eustachian, the obstructive eustachian tube, because if the symptoms go away after uh, a grommet, then you know you did the right diagnosis. And we have interventional causal therapy options. This is for the obstructive um, eustachian tube dysfunction. The balloon is the balloon dilatation, and it's scientifically very, very well proven, as, as I will show in the literature later. And of course, you have other not so well proven options for the open tube, for the patchulous tube. Well, there are many therapy options and some of them have more a historic character. For example, as the guiding wire Volker Janke used in the 1980s, this nowadays is obsolete. And the same is true for diathermy and cautery. I have personally no experience with the tuba clean device. Um, grafting can be a method for patulous tube and then we can use either collagen, teflon or fat. A laser tuboplasty is promoted by some colleagues and also the plugging with the patulous tube can work. And the most established therapy for obstructive um, eustachian tube dysfunction is the balloon dilatation. Well, here you have a, um, here you have a picture in the model and you see you insert the catheter in the cartilaginous part of the eustachian tube. You, know, you may not be um, anxious about harming the um, bony part. Um, even if we use a pressure of 10 bar, um, there is no danger. And this could be shown in many studies. And this is the reason why we don't do CT scans anymore. You can insert the catheter either both with the endoscope in the same nose, or you can do them on both sides, or you can use it transorally, um, something I will show you later. The indications for a balloon dilatation are first of all pressure equilibration problems. Other indications are recurrent middle ear effusion with grommet extrusion. Um, we do it in, in patients that um, 
have problems with Valsalva and show a middle ear pathology. And we do it in some patients, in selected patients with middle ear pathology um, that have recurrent perforations, um, that have revision temp tympanoplasties, and sometimes we try to prevent uh, an extrusion of a prosthesis um, beforehand. Well, here are some pictures of a recent operation I did. And you see we did it in the right ear. You see I insert a catheter and after waiting two minutes and blocking it with a 10 bar, I extract the blocked catheter and sometimes you see the mucus coming and I know this was a good measure. And I want to um, show you also when you look in the coane, you see the, um, the mucosa there that is quite uh, venous and quite, um, quite bulging. So you can see that there is a mucosa problem too. And this also makes a problem when you go through the nose. And this was a trans um, oral operation I did. Well, let's come to results and complications. And um, there's a very good, from my point of view, one of the best studies done by Dennis Poe and co-workers in 2018. He studied 139 patients um, over 21 years of age, and it is a prospective randomized study, so it has a very high evidence. And they compared uh, eustachian tube dilatation plus medication, that means nasal drops, against medication alone. And they controlled first after six weeks. Uh, we could see that um, tympanometry was better in the BET plus group um, with 52% improvement, whereas the medication alone group only showed an improvement in 30% patients. After two years, in 60% patients, um, the tympanometry was normal um, and they also used the ETDQ7 and their 50% of 56% of the patients in the BET plus group reported um, significant improvement and it was only 8.5% in the medication alone group. So this I think is an impressive result. And there are some other good studies. There are retrospective. Um, there is the studies mainly from the Bielefeld group um, with Holger Suthoff. And here we have a retrospective study over five years with more than 600 patients and more than 5,000, uh, sorry, 1,000 1, years. And the improvement here was between 70 and 82%. And another very interesting study I picked is the study from Matthias Tisch from the Ulm group, because they were the first one to study children and their children were between four and 12 years of age. This is a retrospective study in about 167 patients with nearly 250 years. And the improvement in this group was 63%. So it works also in children, and this is a very uh, interesting finding. Let's come to the literature and my personal experience. First of all, um, eustachian tube dilatation is not an experimental surgery, but it is very well proven, and there are more than 200,000 procedures since 2009, and the number is steadily growing. There are some complications that have been reported, such as emphysema, minor bleeding, tinnitus and oral fullness, and also otitis media with effusion, but the rate is very, very low. Um, Heusmann did this in a review about um, 1155 patients, and he published this in La Rigoscope in 2018. And I think even the complication rate is going down because we get more and more experience. As I said, CT scan is not necessary. 
Um, my personal experience is I operated more than 500 patients since 2012, mainly adults, but also a few children. I started with children over 10 years. As diagnostic tools, I regularly use tympanometry, tubomanometry, and in the last years, I used sonotomometry, and all patients get an ETD Q7. When we look at the results, there are excellent in patients with Barrow challenge. We, um, we published a study on the German ENT Congress 2014 in professional divers, um, 42 professionals that really had problems in their job. And um, we had an excellent improvement rate of 87%. In patients with a normal obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction, our success rate is about 70 to 75%. In patients with chronic ears, the um, results were more mediocre or fair. About 50% of these patients improve, but 50% do not. And I found um, in oncologic patients that had undergone radiotherapy um, only disappointing results. Here I think the balloon is um, not too helpful and we rely mainly on the grommet. We also found complications, of course. In these patients, I had two times an otitis media with a fusion after a balloon had a defect. Um, we had in three times an increase of tinnitus. Six patients reported a persistent oral fullness. We had no emphysema and no bleeding. And maybe the oral fullness was because we didn't do a proper diagnosis about a patchulous tube, but this is to be discussed later. I myself, I modified my approach because I started transnasally and now I go transoral. I found it much easier. From my ex experience, I can say um, the eustachian tube patient, uh, eustachian tube dilatation does not solve all problems, so it's not a silver bullet, but in the majority of our patients, it is definitely worth a try. Let's come to the patchulous tube and we see here um, the, the, the typical finding um, with synchronous to breathing. Um, what can we do? Well, plugging has been uh, discussed. Um, also, I think grommet is very helpful in these cases, which is easy to understand. From my point, ligature, ligature is obsolete and grafting can also be discussed. Um, well, when we look at the, hist uh, at the literature, there's a very nice study from Brian Ward um, about the uh, outcomes um, at the management of patchulous tubes. And what he did, he um, studied 80 patients with four different interventions. That was balloon, that was um, hyroxyl apatite, there was laser uh, surgery of the eustachian tube and also obliteration. And the criteria for success in this study group was um, a symptom-free interval um, for 12 months. The result was that in 80 patients, 241 interventions during this, uh, during this time were necessary. And what we have to say is that it is quite complicated and quite tricky. And we had um, a balloon dilatation in 52%, and in the obliteration patients, in 81%, a grommet was necessary as a second intervention. So what is the conclusion? First of all, let me say um, anatomy and function of the eustachian tube is very complex and still not completely understood. And the consequence is that we have no universal diagnostic tool. And as I could show, there is no 
universal therapy, but eustachian tube dilatation is a very well proven and effective therapy for obstructive eustachian tube dysfunction. So it is a safe and rational option and we combine it with a grommet, what we do, what we like to do in children. We have to rule out a petulous tube beforehand because otherwise we run into trouble. The other lessons I have learned is to handle the middle ear mucosa more careful than I did before in ear surgery because of the, um, of the receptors we have there. And the other thing is that we do a pre-op treatment in chronic ears before operation to try to improve the middle ear irration. This can be uh, a eustachian tube dilatation, but this can also be a medication with nasal drops. So now I am at the end of my presentation and I'm now looking forward for our discussion. So thank you so much for this really great presentation, Professor Di Martino. Any questions? So we'll be open for that. Yeah, you can have now um, the time to uh, post your question in the chat uh, function provided by Zoom, question and answer um, function. So just type in your questions and we are yeah very happy uh, and we have the time now uh, to answer those questions by Professor Di Martino. So I see already some questions um, coming up. So a very nice presentation. Uh, then the question is, um, what is your treatment protocol for petrolous eustachian tube? Yes. Okay. Just can you hear me? Yes, I hope so. So my treatment, yes, my okay. treatment protocol um, is first of all that we start with a um, with um, nasal decongestion, and we do this especially in, in children first because we want to be we want to start conservative. But of course, we have admi administered many patients from from outpatient departments from from other doctors, so they have already tried this. And when we know that um, this was done, then we uh, start um, um, with the um, um, pre-treatment for the eustachian tube. So usually take take a week nasal cortisone again, and if this is the last chance it was done, then we do the um, BET. And we do it also in children, as I said, and quite successfully, of course it does, take uh, some um, time to convince the, the, the parents to do this because this is a pre treatment that is mainly used in adults in Germany, um, but we, um, we are quite successful in convincing them because in many instances, it saves uh, a future operation. And what we also do, we combine it with a um, grommet. Um, well, you, you should ask, why should we do this? Um, because you want to have an instant success. The grommet um, is gone after six months, and this gives time um, that the eustachian tube um, um, is, is, uh, um, is recovering from the swelling that happens after the dilatation, and so we can have an optimal result with this. Thank you so much. So there is uh, plenty of other questions here coming up in the chat box. Another one is, um, uh, do you have any particular reservations or seen any worsening of symptoms in scuba divers? In scuba divers, up to now, not yet. Actually, um, we were quite lucky with it. Actually, scuba divers was, one, was the group where we were most successful. Yeah, it was a very high successful rate. And my coworker, um, um, who is also a, a semi-professional scuba diver and the ENT doctor. So we closely monitored these this patients and they were very, very happy. You know, we're in Germany and they came from Brazil and so on for the BET. And uh, so this was a great success really. So I have no particular reservation to this, no. Okay, great. Then another question um, from a doctor who says, I don't uh, usually place a grommet in the same procedure um, uh, in regards of eustachian tube dilation, because I think it might be difficult 
um, of the realization of Valsalva maneuver, or at least uh, to control it. So what is your experience about it, placing a grommet? Um, oh, well, we do, it, we do it quite often, I, I have to say, frankly. Um, so I don't share this reservation. Um, well, we, we don't know yet because there is no controlled study if you should do it or not, or does it really affect the result? It should not. But I think the psychological aspect is quite uh, important, especially in children. Okay, then um, we have another question. Would you uh, consider Barrow Challenge ETD as a sort of uh, precursor for developing more chronic um, obstructive station tube dysfunction later in life? Yes, I would do, but I cannot really say what are other indicators so that some people go that way and others don't. It's like in many diseases, you know, you have some people who have some kind of light or moderate symptoms in the beginning, but some do recover and some do not. So yes, I do regard it as a precursor, um, but it's just a, this is just a yeah a mild insight, I would, I would call it. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we get another question here. Would you consider a long-lasting tube such as a T-tube rather than a grommet or a pa parella? Yeah, that's the question. Yeah. That depends on the case. So if we have a chronic chronic ear, I tend towards a T-tube um, because I'm not really sure um, if the BET is the silver bullet in this case. As we said, there is success rate is 50%. And so with a with a T-tube, um, at least in the chronic ear, uh, you do not do anything wrong. And even if it, okay. if it goes out, who cares? I mean, um, so um, yes, I tend to, to the T-tube, but I know many other colleagues who do not. Um, this is more, uh, uh, um, how you say, it's... Uh, it's uh, um, regarding the preference of the doctor. Yeah, this is my, like this. this is more my my personal my per my my personal personal preference. You know, probably I'm a bit okay. old school with that, but I, I I look back on more than thirty years of uh, auto surgery uh, experience, and it worked quite well. So then we have another question here. Will you offer a balloon dilatation in patient with uh, eustachian tube dysfunction symptoms? But normal audiogram and normal tympanometry. Yes, That's really yes, tricky one. Will. Yeah, this is also sometimes these are the patients also with with barrow challenge symptoms, um, and uh, yes, we do offer them. Yeah, but very important is to rule out that they do not have a pat patulous tube. This is really one of the most most important differential diagnosis because then do you you really do harm to the patient. Okay. Then uh, somebody is interested in the technique uh, to approach the eustachian tube transorally. So this seems to be uh, not uh, like the, something uh, where here doctors are interested. Uh, can you a little bit share about it? Yeah. Well. Okay. I showed I showed the slide uh, how I do it. I put a, a catheter through the nose and then we um, we elevate the the soft palate. And from there, I go with a 70 degree angle. I go through the mouth from, I have the, um, um, the, 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 op, the um, 70 degree optics in, in one side and on the other side, I, pl uh, I place uh, the, the catheter because um, then the view is better. So I go crosswise more or less. Yeah, if you go on the same side uh, with both instruments, it's always more tricky. This is also what I experienced in the nose. And that is why I changed first from putting one instrument in one side of the node and the other one in the other side. And the same was true in the mouth. Okay, great. Then uh, there's another question. Um, so if you do the BET, do you do it under local or general anesthesia? Uh, yeah, very we have maybe also experienced this both. I, I have seen yeah. people, um, uh, um, I have seen people videos from colleagues from Denmark who do it uh, under uh, local anesthesia? You see the you saw the movie um, with the uh, with the eustachian tube passage, and that was my ear. And I can say that my personal experience was not the most very pleasant one. I think the local is not uh, well is one component, but very important is also the sedation of the patient. So you give them midazolam so that they don't remember afterwards 
what what really happened. Um, my personal experience with the local, and you you can trust me that I had a very experienced colleague, um, was not very pleasant. You really. So I do it under general. Okay, way. yeah, that's, uh, you know it by yourself. So to say, yes, yeah, so I'm there's myself. some pain involved. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, then uh, there's a voice here based on the experience uh, shared um, by uh, on your my uh, experience slide. Um, it seems like the sooner you are able to identify patients with eustachian tube dysfunction and provide them with a BET, the greater the effect of the treatment. Um, what do you think about this statement or this question? I try to be a bit more conservative. Generally, generally mm -hmm. spoken, yes, if you start early, your success will be early. But I, first of all, I, I try all conservative means before I um, I advise a BET, you know, because you have to convince people um, that they are doing the right thing. And sometimes you, you, you have your results if you are persistent and, and if the patients cooperate, you know. If you say, take this and this, you don't really know, you cannot control if they do it. So um, you, you push them into this direction, and when you see it doesn't work, okay, then the BET is great. Okay. Then we have another um, question here. BET can be done in children. Are young patients with a cleft good candidates for BET? Are young people a cleft palate? With cleft palate. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, uh, young oh. patients with a, with a cleft. Yeah, okay. Cleft palate patients are uh, very special, and... Um, because the, the anatomy is, is completely altered. So I think in these patients, I tried this in this patient, but I was not successful with cleft palate patients, you know. All the mechanics re doesn't really work. And um, so I'm not really convinced if this really works in these patients. I had a few of them I tried, but I was not successful in any of these cases. At least not on a persistent, I didn't have persistent um, success. Okay, good. Um, so somebody offered you to uh, call him privately, but we will manage that later on. <laughs> um, so it seems that uh, there's a lot of interest here. So we have another one here. When a patient has typical symptoms, uh, but no diagnostic findings, how do you proceed? How do I proceed? Well, of course, well, um, if I am, if I am, sure that he doesn't have a patulous tube, then I tend to work towards after, of course, having uh, explored all the, the, the um, conservative means, I tend to offer a BET. Yes, because I think I, I, I will not do harm to it, to this. And in, in, in the best, uh, in, in the best situation, he will have a profit from it. So it's very good. Okay, great. Then there's a question regarding bilateral balloon dilatation yes. or um, kind of doing one after the other. So somebody is asking um, if bilateral balloon dilatation is a problem or if you oh, then have the patient two we times. Regularly do, we regularly do it. You know, if you have a if you have a bilateral problem, we solve them, but we try to solve them bilaterally. It's just one procedure. It's it's far more convenient for the patient. You know. Um, I may not say this, but um, and the company may not like to hear it, but we use the same balloon if we can, you know, um, and um, so no, no problem. You can do it, and we do it regularly. Okay, great to hear that. What is your experience with performing BET with adjunctive procedures like tympanoplasty or endoscopic sinus surgery? Do you have any experience here? Well, yes, of course we do have. First of all, with the tympanoplasty uh, in chronic ears, we do it regularly. Um, but as I showed my results, um, they are mixed, you know, and I really do not have a clue. And uh, when it does not work, but we do it because uh, we know that we uh, that in the end it can only be beneficial. With the sinus surgery, um, we there is a very good study that shows that um, sinus surgery itself is very beneficial for the function of the eustachian tube. Um, this is very easy to understand because you have all this inflama inflammatory mucus that runs down the throat and um, passes 
by the um, eustachian tubes. And of course, this makes a swelling and uh, makes problem for the aeration function. Really great for us. And thank you for sharing that. Then another question is, um, do you use uh, local anesthesia or usually do it uh, only on a uh, general full anesthesia? Well, um, I uh, do it on general anesthesia and I'll tell you why. Um, I have seen presentations from friends from Northern Europe who do it in uh, local. Well, um, I myself have done the video that you've seen um, of the passage through the eustachian tube in local anesthesia. And be sure, I had a very good and experienced surgeon to do this. And I remember it as a very unpleasant experience. So this is not something I want to do to my patients. And so we decided to do it um, in general anesthesia. And when you ask me about the local anesthesia, I think the anesthesia itself is not the main component, but the midazolam, the, pa the patients get administered probably does a good job. You know, so um, one can do it, but I wouldn't do it to my patients. Okay, yeah, that's your preference. Uh, do you perform tuboplasty and tympanoplasty in the same session? Yes, we do, we do. And um, we start with the tuboplasty and, and then we turn over to the tympanoplasty. We do this quite often. And what I, I do is um, at the end operation, I give a shot of um, hydrocortisone, 250 milligrams, um, just to prevent this to to um, to prevent uh, a swelling not only in the tube but also in the in the field of operation. So uh, this is quite good. Um, and just um, out of curiosity, um, why do you do it this way and not the other way around? Uh... First, first the surgery and then the eustachian tube. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, we think that the underlying pathology is the consequence of a eustachian tube dysfunction. So I'd rather do the tube before and then the surgery. Okay, then we have another question here. Um, um, how beneficial is the use of long-term uh, in transnasal corticoids and PPI for ETD? Well, um, we also worked on that and I found in many cases um, things, uh, it, it is beneficial. So. Um, eustachian tube dilatation is something we do afterwards. We have ex fully exploited the conservative measures. Okay. Then there is a lot of interest in your um, uh, approach uh, through the mouth, so to say. Oh, um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> probably something not many uh, surgeons are performing. So we are asked uh, if there are videos available uh, which you can uh, share because uh, apparently it, there's some. I should have a video because yeah. the pictures uh, you've seen um, from the last operation was from a video. But I didn't publish that because it's for me, it's everyday routine. I can tell you why I do it this way. Of course, I started, like most of you, I started to insert the instrument and the catheter in the same nose. So what happens? It is very narrow. If you are lucky and you have a straight nose and there is no obstruction, you may be successful. But once you fail, it starts bleeding and then it takes a long time until you have correct vision. Okay, so, that, so then I changed my my uh, my approach and then I I inserted the catheter in one nose and and the um, and the endoscope in the other in the other uh, nose that worked better but still if you have an obstruction um, in the in the nose where you have the endoscope then it bleeds again and then the same problem so and then I thought how can I do this better how can I avoid this and I I thought uh, I do it transorally. And then I put a small catheter to the nose and I do, I lift up the, uh, the soft palate. And then from one side, I take the endoscope uh, in the mouth and from the other side, I do the catheter. And so they don't block each other. And I have a very good view, a very good vision. And this makes, facilitates things very much. Okay. Then we have another question reaching us uh, regarding the petulous tube. Uh, do you have a surgical protocol for your patients and uh, especially to those ones uh, who do not respond to a conservative treatment? Yeah, well, pet, uh, petulous tube 
is a very difficult issue if, as you have seen by uh, some of the studies. And I've talked to many people who also, and I use also laser and so on, but it is something, it is very hard to judge if you have done, for example, if you have uh, done too much or not enough, is this lasting, what material should I use, for example? And um, so I turned to a very, very, well, you can say primitive way. Um, I just use a grommet. I do not do any harm to a patient, especially when we are not 100% sure that's a patrolist tube. And if it's a patrolist tube, it works quite well. Okay, great. Um, and then there's another question. Uh, it's kind of um, relating to a study you showed. Um, what was the difference in your study between chronic ear and chronic eustachian tube and the third group? How do you do the selection of the patients for the three groups? I think there was success rate uh, 87% and 90% and 50%. Yeah, well, first of all, I think the, his the patient history is, is, is key. I mean, the, the high success rate we have in patient that mainly have symptoms of a borrowed challenge. We had this 87% in this professional diver study. I know it was really, um, was really um, wonderful because these people suffered and they could have lost their jobs if, they, uh, if their tube didn't work. So these people are very, very, very uh, uh, good candidates. When we go to the chronic ears, we look at, is this a child, for example, where still um, the, the eustachian tube is still growing uh, with age, or is this someone who has already for 40 years a cholesteatoma and um, again, 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 a recurrent. So these people are not so, um, so good candidates, but mainly people who have a problem that is confined to the middle ear cavity, um, they really have a profit. Okay, great. Then we have another question. Do you do intratympanic dexamethasone before or at the same time when you do the tuboplasty? When I do, pardon? The tuboplasty, when you do the uh, tuboplasty. Oh, I don't do this, but uh, I also did, um, I, I, I rinsed the eustachian tube in some, in some instances, you know, when I open the middle ear and you have granulation and so on, and you remove the granulations, you see the you see the orifice of the eustachian tube from the uh, middle ear cavity, and you, but you don't know what is in the tube. So from from uh, these instances, I I in, I inject or I rinse um, cortisone uh, in the bony part of the eustachian tube, just to to uh, decongest it, okay. uh, and to give better um, uh, better start for the um, for the wound healing of the tympanoplasty. And there is another question upcoming here. What about the risk of secondary stenosis of the eustachian tube after the insertion? Yeah, of the theoretically, yeah. there is a risk. I have never seen one, actually. Um, but yes, of course, it has to be discussed. But I do not know from the literature any insights that this could happen. But I, won't, I will not rule out it. Yeah, then we have like a comment here regarding the trans oral approach uh, yes. and wanted to confirm uh, that the endoscope is only in the mouth and the catheter you do spill through the nose, right? That's uh, no, 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 no. I know nose. The, the, the catheter I put into the nose is a suction catheter. No, I, I, I put, uh, put the suction catheter through the nose and then I make a knot, I knot and to lift the soft pellet, you know. Okay. So, and then I put the, the BET and the endoscope, I put both into the mouth, but a different side, one right, one left, you know, so, so that, they don't, that, that you don't have two instruments on the same size because this was, would hinder your maneuverability. So then we can confirm both to, uh, through the mouth. Thank you. And then there's another question. What would you do with a 12 year old girl that has her tympanic membrane retracted. We always put ventilation tubes and dilate the eustachian tube and uh, it doesn't improve, okay? This would um, be, okay, this would be a candidate I would try a, uh, a BET for sure. I mean, um, this could be a very, uh, this could be a very good candidate. I would try this, yes. Okay, good. 
I think we still have one more question left here. Yes, please. And um, do you have any thoughts on patients who complain of earfulness uh, plus minus pain with normal, with normal tympanometry? They don't benefit from grommets and uh, sometimes patients receive their symptoms to be worse with grommets. Uh, well, we sometimes have patients who report these problems. They are very rare. Um, earfulness, I have seen this after BET also, but after wrong patient selection, obviously these were patients that mainly suffer from a patchiness too. So you worse the situation. Um, but besides this, it is very, very rare. We have patients that report ear fullness and whatever you do, you don't find anything. I personally, I think it comes from the neck or sometimes it comes only, it can come from the mandibular joint. Um, when you have problems there, this can also make discomfort, to, a feeling of discomfort for the for the middle ear. Okay, so thank you. Not, not a real middle ear problem then. Okay. Good. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Di Martino, for spending your time and answering all those questions uh, from the from the audience. And it was a really a pleasure to have you here. And I think we learned a lot, and especially also about your special technique uh, to do BET. Yeah, and the audience, if you are interested in trialing uh, the tuba vent balloon uh, catheter or want to um, receive more information or application videos or our latest scientific papers, uh, yeah, you just can contact us on our Spiegel and Thais website. There you find our contact form or you can just give us a call. And yeah, we are happy to help you out, to connect you and support you. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of your day. And uh, thank you so much for your great attendance. Thank you also, Professor Di Martino, again. Well, thank you, Esther, and all the organizing team for the great job you have done and for your patience and for your diligence. And greetings to all our viewers. And feel free to ask questions to me. Um, just send me an email or whatever. Uh, I will answer them. And, and I, I will be happy for a vivid exchange. So good night. And thank you very much. Thank you so much.